Hi everyone, I'm back again. I just wanted to um, say a big thank you to um, Miss Tyson's class in Pennsylvania. You have given me a lot of um, really good um, reading material this year. And I'm very, very thankful for that. Keeps me out of trouble. And so I want to say a big thank you and a hi and a shout out to your class there in Pennsylvania. And also, um, I would like to say a special shout out to my buddy Ethan. And thank you so much for the gift card for Christmas. That was very generous of you and your family. And I am hoping and praying that the rest of this school year is going to be just a blast, you guys. So I am going to um, start reading today with Brian's Winter Chapter 6. And I'm just going to keep reading for a little bit, and let's see how far we get. Okay, so here we go. Brian's Winter by Gary Paulson, Chapter 6. In the morning, he pushed the door to the side gingerly, looking both ways. He didn't see the skunk. And he pushed the door all the way open and went outside. Still, no skunk. Before heading back for the trench he had dug for a toilet, he pulled the door back over the opening. No sense taking chances. And then trotted off into the woods. When he came back, he looked all around the area and still couldn't see the skunk. And he shrugged. It must have moved on. He kindled an outside fire using coals from the shelter fire and soon had a small cooking fire going. The cold lasted longer now into the morning, and the ice had moved farther out into the lake, almost 40 feet from the shore all around. The rabbit skin vest in the fire felt especially good. He took the last of the jellied meat in the pot, added a piece of red venison, and put it on the side of the fire to cook while he took stock of his situation. The shelter was done or as done as he could get it, and almost airtight and warm when he had a fire going inside. He had nine arrows finished, which seemed like a lot. How many times would he have to defend himself? Besides, even if he had used all the arrows, he could get more tips from the arrow stone, and the wood shafts would be there in the winter as well. Winter. The word stopped him. He knew nothing about it. At home, in upstate New York, there was snow, sometimes a lot of it, and cold at times, cold enough to make his ears sting, but he could get inside, and he had good warm clothes. Here, he suspected the winter would be a lot worse, but he didn't know how much worse, or how to prepare for it. Just then the meat was done, and at exactly that moment, and he, and exactly that moment, as he pulled the pot off the fire, the skunk came waddling around the end of the rock, stopped four feet away, and raised its tail. What? Brian winced, waiting, but the skunk did not spray. And Brian took a piece of meat from the pot and threw it on the ground next to it. The skunk lowered its tail, smelled the meat, and when it proved too hot to eat, it backed away and raised its tail again. Listen, you little robber, I'm sorry it's too hot. You'll just have to wait until it cools. The skunk kept its tail up but lowered it a bit and seemed to understand. And in a moment, when the meat cooled, it picked up the chunk and disappeared with it around the corner of the large rock that was the back wall of Brian's shelter. Where are you going? Brian stood up, followed at a distance, moving slowly, and when he came around the rock 
the skunk was gone. Disappeared completely. But Brian walked all around the end, back again, and was on his second loop when he saw some grass wiggling at the edge where the rock met the ground. The grass there was thick and about a foot tall and hid the dirt from view. Brian moved closer and saw some fresh earth and a hole beneath the rock. And as he watched, he saw black and white fur moving down inside the hole. You're living here? Brian shook his head. You've moved in on me? The skunk stopped moving inside for a moment, then started again. And while Brian watched, little spurts of dirt came out of the entrance as the skunk dug back in under the rock. Brian turned away. Wonderful. I've got a roommate with a terminal hygiene problem. Inside of four days, a routine was established. The skunk came to the entrance in the morning flicked its tail in the air, and waited to be fed. Brian fed it, and it went back to its burrow until the next morning. It wasn't exactly friendship, but soon Brian smiled when he saw the skunk. He named it Betty, after deci deciding that it was a female, and that it looked like his aunt, who was low and round and waddled the same way. <clears throat> He looked forward to seeing it. After developing the acquaintance with the skunk, Brian had gone back to work on the heavy bow. The arrows were done, but he had yet to string the bow and was stymied on where to get a string long enough until he saw the cord at the end of the sleeping bag. It was braided nylon, one-eighth of an inch thick and close to six feet long enough to go around the bag twice when it was rolled up. The cord was sewn into the end of the bag, but he sharpened the knife on a sharpening rock and used the point to open the stitching enough to free the cord. It proved to be difficult to string the bow. In spite of his scraping and shaping, the limbs were still very stout, and the bow bent only with heavy pressure. He tied the string to one end, then put the tied end in a depression in a rock on the ground and used his weight to pull down the top end while he tied the cord in place. It hummed when he plucked it, and the strength of the wood seemed to sing in the cord. He took four of the arrows and moved to a dirt hum hummock near the lake shore. He put an arrow in the bow and fitted it to the string, raised the bow, and looked down the shaft at the target and drew the arrow back, or tried to. When it was halfway to his chin, the bow seemed to double in strength, and he was shaking with all the exertion by the time he got the feathers all the way back, and the cord seemed to be cutting through his fingers. He released quickly before he had time to aim properly and saw the arrow crease the top of the hummock, slip onto the lake ice, jump off the ice, and fly across the open water in the middle, and land skittering across the ice on the far side of the lake. A good 200 yards. At the same time, the string slapped his arm so hard it seemed to tear the skin off, and the rough front end of the feathers cut the top of his hand as they passed over it. Wow. He could not see the arrow, but he knew where it had gone and would walk around the lake later and retrieve it. Now he had to practice. He changed the angle he was shooting at so the arrows would go across the lake if he missed, when he missed, he thought, smiling, and moved closer to the hummock. It was, a hard, it was hard to judge the strength of the pull of the bow. He guessed 50, 60 pounds of pull were required to get the string back to his chin, and every shot hurt his arm and fingers and hand. But it was worth it. The arrows left the bow so fast that he couldn't see them fly, and they hit so hard that two of them drove on through the hummock and kept going for 15 or 20 yards and broke the stone tips. 
He made new tips that night, and it was while he was making them that he knew he would be hunting bigger game. It was strange how the thought came, or how it just seemed to be there. He had made the bow for protection. He had thought only in terms of protection all the while he was making arrows. But somewhere along the way, the knowledge that he would use it to hunt was just there. Maybe it was eating the meat from the dough that had done it. There was so much of it, and it tasted so good and was easier to deal with than the smaller animals. Whatever the reason, when he aimed at the hummock to practice, he saw the chest of a deer. He shot all that day until his shoulders were sore, and he had broken an arrow and two more tips by hitting small rocks along the ground. Then at dark, he built a fire, cooked some meat, fed Betty, who arrived just as the meat was done, and retired to the shelter to fix arrows. He would hunt big tomorrow. He thought he would try to get a deer. That's the end of chapter six. So you can pause the video here if that is all you need to read right now. But I'm going on to chapter seven. Chapter seven. He didn't know the time, but somewhere in the middle of the night, he awakened suddenly. He had come to rely, rely on his senses, and he knew something had changed to snap him awake that way, and he lay with his eyes wide in the dark, listening, smelling, trying to see. He did not have long to wait. There was a soft rustle, then a woofing sound, and the whole wall of the shelter peeled away from the rock as if it caught in an earthquake. Away and down, and Brian, still in his bag, was looking up in the dark at the enormous form of a bear leaning over him. There was no time to react, to move, to do anything. Meat. Brian had time to think. He smelled the venison and come for it. He's come for the meat, and it was true. The bear had come for the meat, but the problem was that Brian lay between the bear and the meat, and the bear cuffed him to the side. As it wasn't much of a cuff, as it was, it wasn't much of a cuff, nowhere near what the bear could have done, which would have broken Brian's legs. But the bag was zipped, and Brian became tangled in it and couldn't move fast enough to stay out of the way, so the bear hit him again. This time, hard. The blow took Brian in the upper thigh, and even though the bag was solid enough to nearly dislocate his hip, he cried out, Ah! The bear stopped dead in the darkness. Brian could see the head turn to look back and look down at him. A slow turning, huge, and full of threat. And the bear's breath washed over him, and he thought, I'm going to die now. All this that I have done and I'm going to die because a bear wants to eat and I am in the way. He could see the bear's teeth as it showed them and he couldn't, simply couldn't do anything. Couldn't move, couldn't react. It was over. The bear started to move down toward Brian and then hesitated stopped and raised its head again and turned to look back over its shoulder to the left. <clears throat> Half a beat and Brian lay still, staring up at the bear. But now a new smell over the smell of the bear. A rank, foul, sulfurous and gagging smell as the bear turned and took a full shot of skunk spray directly in the eyes. Betty had arrived. Whether she'd just been out hunting and had come back, or had been awakened and surprised, or simply didn't like bears very much, whatever the reason, she had dumped a full load in the bear's face. The effect was immediate and devastating. Rump! 
The bear seemed to turn inside itself, knocking Brian farther to the side, and rolled backward out of the shelter area, slamming its head back and forth on the ground, trying to clear its eyes, hacking and throwing up as it vanished in the night. Brian looked to the source of all this. Betty stood near the end of the shelter, still with her tail raised, only now aimed at Brian. She twitched at once, then again, and Brian shook his head. I'm sorry, I just didn't think you'd be thinking of food. He took a piece of meat from the pile, a big one, and tossed it to her, and she lowered her tail, picked up the meat, and waddled off into the dark in the direction of her burrow. Brian lay back in his bag. The shelter was a mess. The wall tipped over and his hip hurt, but it wasn't raining and the bag was warm. He could fix things up in the morning. The stink of the skunk was everywhere. Much of what Betty had shot at the bear had gone around it and hit the wall, but Brian didn't ma matter. But Brian didn't mind. In fact, he thought, I've grown kind of fond of it. I'll have to make sure to give her extra food. It was like having a pet nuclear device. <laughs> he went to sleep smiling. In the morning, he found that he the damage was not as extreme as he'd thought. The bear had tipped the wall away and down, but the dried mud had held it together. And Brian, after four heaving tries, tipped it back up and against the rock. He chopped a hole in the, uh, the thin ice near the edge of the lake and brought up new mud to pack in around the seam, and inside an hour it was as good as new. Then he reviewed his thinking. The war bow wouldn't help, at least not as protective device. He'd shot it and made it work for him, but in the dark, in the night, in the shelter, there was no way. He could have gotten the bow aligned or an arrow into the bear, and God knew what would have happened if he had hit the bear with an arrow, especially if he missed anything vital. The bear would have been really mad then. Even Betty wouldn't have been able to stop the thing. Perhaps he thought a lance, a killing lance. If he used the same principle as with the arrows, he went back to the stone he'd been chipping arrowheads from and studied it. He would need a wider, longer head, and the flakes came off too small for a spear. Near it, there were other black stones, however, and he tapped at them with the back of the hatchet, knocking off flakes until he hit one that had a bigger pattern. Three times he hit and took off flakes that were irregular or that broke in the middle. But on the fourth try, he came away with a piece almost as wide as his palm and about seven inches long, tapering to a sharp point and with two edges like razors. He worked tie notches into the round end and mounted the point in one of his hardwood spears, carefully splitting the wood back and then tying the head in place with a thin strip of deer hide which proved to be much tougher than the rabbit skin, and burning the hair off when he was done. He hefted the lance and held it out, bracing with his arm. It wouldn't do any good to throw, but for in close, like last night, if he had to use it, the head should cause some damage, or at least discourage a bear. He nodded. Good. If nothing else, it gave him a feeling of security. Later, he would think on how strange things were. He would never see the bear again, and inside the shelter, he would never be threatened again. Yet, the lance would save his life. Ooh, I like that last sentence. Yet, the lance would save his life. Okay, interesting. So that was all of part one. Part one, if you'll remember, was fall.
So this was all taking place in the fall when the weather was beginning to turn colder. But now we have come to part two, winter. And I think I'm going to stop here for this video. So that's chapters six and seven. And once again, thank you, Miss Tyson and your class in Pennsylvania. And uh, my buddy Ethan, um, can't wait to meet you someday. Cannot wait to meet you someday. My blessings to you all. Until the next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Bye, everyone.